He was famous for his movie role as Crocodile Dundee in the 1980s. But now Paul Hogan is facing serious tax evasion charges in Australia. Tax officials say Hogan owes the government 35 million Australian dollars in back taxes. Australia's tax office barred Paul Hogan, who is best known for his role as Crocodile Dundee, from leaving the country over a disputed 35 million Australian dollars tax bill. A departure prohibition order was served to the actor after he came to Australia over the weekend to attend his mother's funeral. Hogan is a resident of California. Hogan's lawyer says his family is very upset. The family are very upset. Um, Paul's wife and son are in California not knowing whether they've got to upend their life and think about moving back to Australia or what they're supposed to do. Robinson said his client had little prospect of disappearing because he was one of the most famous faces on the planet. And he doesn't even want to talk about the possibility of running because it's not what he wants to do. He wants to have this taxation position resolved. Australia's tax office claims Hogan used offshore bank accounts to evade income tax payments. This has um, come on top of or, or come in the midst of a period of grieving and obviously emotional anxiety for Paul. Since the investigation began, Hogan has visited Australia several times. The investigation is ongoing and no charges have been filed against Hogan. It's hardly the end of the world, but for these Beaconsfield neighbours, it just might be. They're embroiled in a long-running, bitter dispute over a fence, and now it's got physical. Bill Oakes can't believe it's come to this. I just ended up in a pool of blood. Skeletal fractures, um, a real, I need a realignment on my nose and surgery. He says his neighbour attacked him outside court after they were trying to sort out a dispute over a fence which divides their properties. I think my neighbour was a bit angry because they changed the date of the hearing into September. I think he wanted a, um, a quick result. The fence fight has been going on for five years, both men arguing over its height. Mr Oakes says his neighbour wants it raised to 1.8 metres, but he wants it to 1.5 metres, a 30 centimetre difference. Bill Oakes admits that this bitter dispute over the fence has become somewhat ridiculous, but he says last week's attack outside the court has left him no option but to file a restraining order against his neighbour, banning him from coming within a 10 metre distance. Police are investigating Mr Oakes' assault claim. The bitter court battle over the fence continues. Peter Capsanis. After noise complaints, the biggest cause of grief between neighbours are trees. How much you love or hate one depends on whose backyard it's in and what damage it's causing. In some cases, tree disputes are costing people hundreds of thousands of dollars. As Rodney Lowe's reports, you never know when your place could become the centre of a tree fight. Did you get me up? No. I'm not prepared to go to the High Court if I have to. It can get pretty volatile. Local government's love of trees in our backyards means cutting them down can cost you thousands. Rugby league legend Gordon Tallis was stung $12,000 after illegally clearing his block of trees. He said posed a danger to his family. Go ask people at the Gap how dangerous it was. But this is Brisbane, the Gap. Holy crap! It struck with oh incredible God. force. <gasps> it was like an explosion. I'm lucky to be alive. And while taking the axe to some unwanted trees could cost you a hefty fine, leaving them could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars more. Give people a little bit of power and they abuse it. 
For 13 years, Graham and Jan Morris have been fighting in court to remove the order on their old fig tree. A city council officer declared it protected. Just bullies. Little busybody bullies. Problem is, the monstrous tree and roots restrict the development of their site in one of Brisbane's most expensive suburbs, reducing the value of their property by up to half a million dollars. The courts have now even sided with them, saying the council can't have it both ways, keeping the tree and charging premium rates. They've just had their rates bill slashed by 25%. It would reflect the true value of the land in the circumstances. But councils aren't the only ones sticking their noses in other people's business. In Gordon Tallis's case, his neighbours liked his trees and had them protected. I guarantee you, he won't be coming over for a barbecue, I know that much. Get down, you tree. No. F***ing get down. No. That's all right. Go again and you watch where the next rock's going to hit. And that's what's upset this neighbour, who really liked the trees next door. You'll be pruning the tree, even though you may be allowed to prune the tree back to the fence line. The moment you start, the neighbours out, hoses get turned on, words are said, police get called. It, gets, it can get pretty volatile. Arborist Eric Frey says trees are a minefield and you just never know when they're going to blow up into a legal or neighbourhood dispute. Some councils will have blanket protection laws, which mean any tree over a certain size in diameter will be protected. Um, and Brisbane City Council has quite a complex one where it works on um, corridors, rivers, estuaries, even man-made waterways. He says even the process by which you do things makes a difference. In some cases, you could bulldoze every tree in your block, but as soon as you put in a development application, everything is protected. Well, we've had a, a person in Gundale where that's happened, and uh, they were extending the house, putting a deck on. Um, as soon as they lodged the DA, immediately the uh, entire property uh, became protected. Um, all, all the uh, vegetation. And often councils fine you just because you didn't ask first. Robin and Tim Chung got stopped mid-removal of a tree in their yard because they didn't get permission. They got permission, then they got fine. The irony of it all is though, 12 months later they gave permission to remove the large tree. Four months after that they take it to court for lopping it. Across the country trees are causing fights and after noise complaints they're the number one catalyst for neighbourhood feuds. Loving trees can all come down to whose backyard they're in. Rodney Lowe's reporting on the Battle of the Backyards. The ABC's expose of cruelty in Indonesian abattoirs has brought an immediate response from the federal government. It slapped a ban on exports of live cattle to at least the 11 slaughterhouses shown in last night's Four Corners program. And Labor's backbench is telling its agriculture minister he needs to go even further. Here's political correspondent Greg Jennett. And a warning, this story contains images of distressed cattle. Brutal and blood smeared. The suffering in Sumatran slaughterhouses <laughs> rang out in homes across the nation and it set off a stampede in the capital. We've got to immediately stop the export of animals uh, to Indonesia and we've got to wind up the industry in three years. This trade needs to stop. The Australian government needs to do the right thing and ban exports to Indonesia. Pressure was building. It is a matter that we just get seriously. Not only from the animal rights activists who helped record the slaughters. The public response today has just been overwhelming. People are just outraged. But also from caucus. Joe Ludwig had started the day pausing exports of Australian supplied restraining boxes and seeking advice. We do need to invest we do need to look at uh, what we can do and what regulatory options are available to me. But he stopped short of banning cattle shipments until he found himself in the midst of a caucus uprising. During caucus, I come to the conclusion that there was an important issue to move uh, to uh, suspend trade uh, to those uh, 11 uh, 
And uh, forgive me if I don't get the number right, I understand it's 11. That's a temporary ban on at least the 11 abattoirs featured in the Four Corners program. The minister didn't have a choice. No fewer than 20 Labor MPs were demanding action. And they're not stopping at 11 abattoirs. If the government doesn't go further, they'll push for a motion at their next meeting demanding a halt to all live shipments to Indonesia. Animals having their throats half slit and dying, lingering horrible deaths, uh, really is absolutely unsatisfactory and unacceptable. We can do better. So we want to see all trade to, a, to Indonesia ceasing as at this moment. The message is getting through. If we want to go that far, it's certainly on the table. But not yet settled. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Canberra. New South Wales residents fear they're losing a vital community institution. Three suburban Sydney post offices will close next month. Several others have already shut up shop. This was a message which couldn't get lost in the post. Hundreds of furious Glebe residents rallied today to stop its imminent closure. This site has been a postal site since about 1809. Would you believe it? 200 years. Australia Post intends to do away with the historic site next month. Glebe joins a growing list of suburban post offices being stamped out. Taramara and Wallara will also close in February. One of the CBD stores has already shut. Australia Post has a community and social obligation. Well, the community will be devastated. And I don't, I don't know how some of the people will manage. In a statement, Australia Post says it understands the closures have caused community concern. It says it's not withdrawing services altogether but finding more sustainable ways to provide postal services. Post boxes will remain a fixture on local streets and all employees are expected to be relocated. Melinda Nusofora, 10 News.